Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. I'm John Allen. I'm the president of the Brookings Institution. And to those who are tuning in via webcast, thank you for joining us from near and far. We're glad to have you with us and we're honored by your presence. And it is a pleasure this morning to have everyone here and to hear our remarks and our panel discussion on Libya. We're joined this morning by a number of former diplomats, esteemed guests and journalists, and you're most welcome. You enhance this session. We're also joined this morning, we're very honored by the presence of the Libyan Ambassador to the United States, Her Excellency Wafa Ugegis, the Ambassador who kindly agreed to join us this morning and to offer her comments as well. And Ambassador, thank you for your encouragement of this study and thank you for all that you're doing for the Libyan people in the United States. So to begin, ladies and gentlemen, in no uncertain terms, Libya ranks among the most complex challenges of the Middle East and North Africa. Libya, though free from the authoritarian rule of Muammar Gaddafi, continues to exist as a country divided, with violence ever looming. The challenging political environment in Libya is only compounded by ongoing concerns related to mass migration, human trafficking, as well as the efforts of terrorist groups like Daesh, the Islamic State, and Ansar al-Sharia, who see Libya as a safe haven and an operational platform for their many nefarious activities. As well, recent reporting from Reuters has indicated that Khalifa uh, Haftar and his Libyan National Army are actually eyeing Tripoli, the capital of Libya and the home of the UN-recognized Government of National Accord. These matters only further complicate the situation in this country. This morning, we've gathered together to discuss a consortium effort on the future of Libya and our report entitled, Empowered Decentralization, a City-Based Strategy for Rebuilding Libya. As our upcoming panel will discuss in detail, this paper articulates a city-based approach for the stabilization and the development of Libya's politics, economy, and security, and is intended to be tailor-made for both the unique cultural dynamics of Libya and its people, as well as the potential special role of the United States and what it can do and what it can play along with key allies in making these recommendations a reality. Furthermore, this report reflects an important task force approach and a uniquely interdisciplinary, interthink tank, and international effort. We had scholars joining us from a number of think tanks here in Washington and around the world to include the Carnegie Endowment, the Atlantic Council, and CSIS, as well as Brookings Doha Center, and our partner institution in Milano, ISPI. I could not be prouder of the group that came together under such short notice to begin to work on this effort. Ladies and gentlemen, this task force was very careful and acted thoughtfully in assessing how best to support the Libyan people. And it's important that we note, we note, that we took into account the trauma and the great violence that the Libyan people endure. And that has been done and continues to be done to them to this day. They've been forced to endure tremendous hardship and the world must not stand idly by while the political situation in Libya stands at the knife's edge. That perspective and that urgency was at the very forefront of our minds while developing this report. And this report could not have been done. In fact, it would have been meaningless without that context. I'd like to speak now directly to the Libyan people to whom we're broadcasting via webcast today. First, let me thank you for your thoughts on this work that we've done. I've seen at least one paper prepared by a Libyan, young Libyan scholar uh, in Libya. Those insights and others that we have received from, directly from the Libyan people have been very thoughtful and very helpful to us, and will continue to shape our thinking on these matters. Second, we in this task force know your trials continue to be great 
and that the road to national reunification and peace will inevitably be long and it will be arduous. But also know that the American people and America's allies have not forgotten you. Your path to freedom was costly and it remains perilous. And there is promise on the horizon, but we also know that we have to hear from you and that we want you to know that we stand with you. Libya Nanu Ma'ak. This report and this morning's public event are for us only one small step towards a better future for your important country and your noble people. It was a deeply personal effort for our team. And we're hopeful that this will spur continue, continued meaningful dialogue and progress in the weeks and months and years to come, not just here in Washington, but in the capitals of our allies and the capitals around the world, as well as with meaningful organizations that can facilitate a credible, permanent, and peaceful outcome for all the Libyan people. As far as we're concerned, this work has only just begun, and we look forward to bringing to bear our collective expertise, wherever it may be of benefit to the long-term health of the state of Libya and to the people of Libya. So with that, let's move forward with today's event. And let me turn uh, the remarks over to Ambassador Bugegas for her own set of remarks. And once she has concluded, we'll then move to the on-the-record panel featuring six of the 17 scholars who helped to bring this report to reality. For now, on behalf of Brookings, on behalf of the institutions involved, Madam Ambassador, we welcome you to the stage and we thank you for your support. Ladies and gentlemen, esteemed guests, Thank you, General Allen, for your very kind introduction and for your leadership on this event. Thank you to each of the scholars and luminaries who worked this very thoughtful strategy published last month. While there have been many efforts to support Libya's transition to democracy since the end of 2011, they have had a similar orthodoxy and often were based upon reconstruction efforts in other countries. We know a cookie-cutter approach won't work in the Middle East and North Africa because each country is different. Yes, Libya faces challenges that are similar to other countries, but it has unique demographies and resources that makes its situation different from all other countries that sought to transition to democracy. I commend the authors of this strategy for formulating their recommendations based upon deeper studied observations and analysis of the current dynamics in Libya. I also commend them for suggesting a new approach not previously attempted. And new ideas are very much needed in Libya and I look forward to all of you pursuing this kind of dialogue. I will refrain from commenting further on the specific recommendations because they are new, but I know they will be studied very closely in Libya. I will conclude, and I will make very, my remarks very brief because I want the panel to start. I will conclude by commenting on one observation that is made throughout the report. Yes, it's true, the United States is viewed as one of the most neutral actors in Libya and is pursuing an agenda intended to benefit all Libyans. For this reason, I know that Libyans welcome the recommendations by the authors that the United States enhances its engagement in Libya. Our national security is very much tied to the national security interest of the United States. Thank you again for recognizing this and for promoting new ideas on how to pursue our common national security interest. 
thank you so much. And I look forward to hear the analysis and I look forward to hear responses from everybody. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Madam Ambassador, President Allen, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for being here. I'm Mike O'Hanlon with the Foreign Policy Program. I had the real uh, privilege and pleasure of helping coordinate this project, which was, for me, an education with some of the best people in the world who know Libya, have lived Libya, uh, in, in one of our panelists' case, is Libyan, uh, and have a lot to offer, I think, in terms of this debate. How we'd like to proceed now is to essentially go through the panel, and I'll introduce them briefly in just a moment, with two rounds of discussion before we go to you for your thoughts and questions a little bit later on. First, I want to ask the panelists to help us understand Libya today. It's an issue that has only intermittently received American attention. We know it's now been eight years since President Obama asked the UN Security Council for authorization to protect civilians in Libya. Later that year, Muammar Gaddafi was overthrown and killed. The following year, of course, the US ambassador was killed. The United States, since that time, has tended not to spend a lot of focus or energy on the broader UN enterprise, but we know that uh, perhaps there could be an opportunity for re-engagement at this point, and that was part of why President Allen asked us to convene this study group. And we want to help you catch up. So some of you know the situation on the ground very well. Others are more like me, uh, coming at this with uh, maybe a generalist or a regionalist eye, but not a lot of knowledge about Libya itself. And we want to make sure we establish a good foundation for discussion. So that will be our first round. And Fred Wary, in particular, who I'm going to introduce in just a second, along with the rest, is just back from Libya. Others are certainly in contact with Libyans or uh, with their networks frequently. So we'll learn a lot from that quick round of uh, introduction and broad uh, remarks on the state of play. Then I'm going to ask each person to essentially talk about one of the big ideas in the report. And there are about five big ideas, I think. So it should work pretty well. But they may talk about each other's remarks, too. And we'll have a little bit of back and forth discussion before we go to you. Let me just say one more broad word of framing. Then I'm going to say a word about each panelist. And then we'll start. Uh, by way of framing, I think we all know, as Americans, those of us who have been watching this debate from Washington, living in this country as US citizens, that Libya is an issue that we've sometimes preferred not to prioritize. That the broader Middle East has been a place where we've had to worry about Iraq and Syria and Afghanistan and Iran, not to mention Saudi Arabia, uh, not to mention the civil war in Yemen. And sometimes Libya just seems like a bridge too far, an issue too far. And it's often been appealing to sort of turn our eyes away from this country that's been afflicted by so much violence. But I would simply suggest that we maybe reconsider, and let me give just two reasons. One of them about danger and threat, but one of them about opportunity. The danger and threat part, I once heard a, a very smart person say that what happens in Libya stays in Libya, like Vegas rules. But the more I learned about Libya, I realized that's just not true. Uh, more foreign fighters came from Libya to Iraq and Syria than I believe from any other country, and certainly for certain periods of those countries' tragic wars, and wound up contributing to Al Qaeda and ISIS. Many of the migrants into Europe in the last few years came through Libya. Most of them were not Libyan. Most of them were coming from other parts of Africa. But this was nonetheless an important place for movement of people. So for those two reasons alone, Libya matters. Uh, Libya can be a threat, can be a danger. Uh, to the broader region and to the international community. But Libya also offers opportunity. John Allen explained uh, the degree of, of difficulty, violence, and chaos that's reigned in Libya for the last eight years. But we also know Libya has some advantages. It's a population of only six million people. That means that the scale of the problem, while substantial, is not necessarily overwhelming. It's primarily Sunni Muslims. It's primarily Arabs. That means that some of the sectarian and confessional tensions that we've seen in other countries that make life and politics even more complicated are perhaps not quite as severe in Libya. Libya has oil. And in fact, there's some semblance of 
daily life continuing in Libya, uh, even despite the lack of a strong government now for eight years. Uh, partly because Libyans are adaptive and entrepreneurial, and they've found ways to do some of the things locally that we're advocating that be more formalized and made more systematic in this report with the city-based concept. They've been doing this already, and the international community in some cases has been helping them already. So I think there's opportunity. The more I learned about Libya doing this report and project, the more I thought that actually there's a moment that we could perhaps take advantage of. So without further ado, Alice Friend, just to my left, is at the CSIS, the Center for Strategic International Studies. She worked on Libya at the Pentagon during the Obama administration, including uh, knowing a great deal about security sector reform and efforts to build a Libyan security force in that period of time. Next to her is my good friend, Fedi Seni Fasanati, who is a non-resident senior fellow here at Brookings and has just arrived to join us from Italy uh, in the last couple of days for a visit. Uh, she's a lifelong expert on Libya and has taught me more about Libyan history uh, than anyone else, and just an elegant writer and very thoughtful a scholar who cares deeply about a uh, country just across the Mediterranean from her own. Next is Jeff Feltman who is the John Whitehead visiting a scholar here at Brookings with a remarkable and distinguished career in U.S. government. He was Assistant Secretary of State for Near Eastern Affairs in the Obama administration under Secretary Clinton. He then went to the U.N. where he was Under Secretary General for Political Affairs. In both portfolios, uh, he was watching this general part of the world and certainly in, at the U.N. a lot about, a lot of his job was about Libya uh, and he's been one of the key intellectual masterminds behind this report and taught me a great deal uh, along the way as well. Next to him, Fred Wary, who has written my favorite book about Libya, The Burning Shores. And uh, like you, perhaps, um, I don't always love every single think tank book I read. And sometimes it's sort of like eating your spinach where you know it's good for you, but you're waiting to get to the end. This book is beautifully written. I mean, when I learned that Fred had been in the U.S. government doing various jobs before, I thought I was surprised. I thought he had been maybe a creative writing camp his whole life because it is just a wonderful narrative and a very easy way to start to learn about Libya's recent history and its complex politics and demographics. Uh, I recommend it very strongly to everyone here. And then finally, uh, Kareem Mezran from the Atlantic Council, who is a, a guy who has, with a big heart and a big brain, taught me about Libya from a Libyan perspective and uh, has studied his native country here in the United States at the Atlantic Council, uh, in Italy, uh, at, at, in Rome, uh, in a, at Johns Hopkins University where he did his graduate work, and uh, really brings a, a passion but also an ability to be dispassionate and to think through the options facing his country uh, from a very thoughtful perspective. So without further ado, thank you for your patience in letting me work through my introduction. And Alice, if, uh, well, well, I guess we'll come down the, the line later, but we'll start in the first instance with Fred, as I said, because Fred is just back from, from Libya, and I wanted him to begin to paint a picture of what's going on on the ground. And I'm not going to ask him to do it comprehensively. After he does that, we'll go to Kareem and then the rest of the panel, just to try to put a few of the basics here before us all. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Mike, for the, uh, the kind introduction, and thank you for your leadership of this project. Also, General Allen, um, it was really a superb uh, team effort uh, to put this together, and um, we do hope it has an impact. Um, I was in Libya during a period of very violent thunderstorms um, that sort of crashed over the, the shores and dumped snow up in the mountains, and this could be sort of a cheap cinematic metaphor for what was happening um, in the country, the sort of um, the chaos or the sort of sense of unease and dislocation that, that was sort of palpable among many people. Um, and this was primarily due to an event that I think we're all aware of, and, and this is uh, General Heftar's Fazan operation. Uh, it was described to me by a UN official as essentially reshuffling the deck of cards um, in Libya. For the first time, you have a, a singular but I, I think more shaky and more schismatic force um, is controlling two-thirds of Libya's territory, although most of the population is still out of his um, control, but he controls the oil, the water. And this has really cast a shadow over po politics and calculations in Tripoli um, and, and the environs of Tripoli. Various towns and militias are making new calculations. There are negotiations underway. Um, in many cities and towns up in the mountains and on the western seaboard, 
you have basically armed groups and political actors that have declared themselves with General Heftar, even while nominally they're under the GNA. Um, so it's really, it's really shaken things up um, quite a bit. Um, I think in terms of our study and this, this city-based approach, the fact that General Heftar was able to move into the South is, is really a, a sort of almost indictment of the failures of, of a city-based approach by the GNA, that there was tremendous resentment in the South among towns and municipalities that they were not getting the support they needed. There was a vacuum into which General Heftar and his LNA moved. Now, their model, what they are bringing, um, there are real questions about its sustainability. Um, they're bringing cash, supplies, apparently uh, policemen from the east. How long is that going to last? There are already signs of, of communal tensions erupting. So as a model of state building, I think it's, it's wise to sort of question this. But it does, again, reemphasize this need for a locally based approach, that we need to address our efforts um, at, at the local level. Um, I think the other, um, <clears throat> the other piece of this that I heard um, just from talking to Libyans, activists, Libyans that were involved in a lot of local governance um, efforts was tremendous appreciation for this report. It validated a lot of what they were doing. It was a sign of encouragement. The fact that it came from the U.S. showed um, that the U.S. You know, was behind this. Um, and so in that sense, it was, it was quite well received. But again, it's, you can't just focus entirely at the local level. There's a real sense that things are stuck at the top. Politics is frozen. There's a number of legislative, administrative fixes that need to happen at the top in terms of budget allocation. And so we can get into the, the technicalities of that um, as well. Um, the general mood on the street in Tripoli, again, was one of, of I think, unease and anticipation. Um, unfortunately, I think the militias are still out in force, very much so. Um, there are still long lines at banks. I witnessed them. The militias are still controlling those, um, those banks. Various militias, um, again, are sort of testing the wind, seeing which way things are going with General Heftar's advance. The very powerful town of Misrata, we can talk about its calculations, its moves toward Heftar. There's some interesting debates happening in that town. Also, the role of Zintan on Tripoli's um, western uh, flank is very important um, as well. And so I think all these actors are making new calculations. Um, and I was also there during the, <coughs> the Abu Dhabi meeting, and we, I'll, I'll leave on this. I mean, th I think this was an important meeting. We can talk about its ramifications. Um, I think there is a general sense of unease among Libyans that their fate is being decided in foreign capitals. Why was this meeting being brokered by the Emiratis? Um, of course, these meetings matter. But again, I think it just underscores that for the perception of local people, there needs to be this grassroots effort. There needs to be this bottom, bottom effort. To be sure, there needs to be reconciliation among the political elites. But again, the local is so important. Um, I'll just conclude with, a, with an emphasis that there are a number of entities uh, doing this sort of local level engagement, UNDP, EU, um, USAID. And I think this report lends a real moral boost to what they're doing, and it adds, I think, the credibility of, of the United States um, behind that locally-based effort. So. Thank you, Fred. Before we go to Kareem, though, I wanted to ask you to add just a little bit more, because I think a lot of people in the room, probably most of whom have not been to Libya, or at least not in a long time, maybe can't really quite still form an image of what life looks like on the street. And because we know this has been a place that hasn't really had a functioning government for eight years. You mentioned the GNA, the Government of National Accord, or, uh, but it's, as you said, not particularly cohesive, not, not yeah. controlling that much of the country. And, uh, and so when you're driving around Libya, uh, and Tripoli in particular, what does it feel like? Does it feel chaotic? Do you feel like you're constantly going through checkpoints, that there are multiple militias controlling different parts of town? Uh, do you hear gunshots? I mean, just even paint sure, a little sure, bit sure, of a sure. more color of, of what it feels like to be in Libya for those of us who have a hard time picturing it, if you could. Well, there is, there is a sense of normalcy. I mean, and look, I'll just underscore this, the tremendous resilience of, of the Libyan people. And, and I don't want to paint, I mean, all we hear about in the news is, 
is the migrant um, story or the you know this this collapsing state. But I, I mean, I went to an art gallery that was thriving. There, there was there were there's there's life in the city, and you know people are out on the street. The old city's open. People are doing business. Um, but the sense is this is all dependent on sort of this negotiated settlement between the various militias that control neighborhoods. So you pass through checkpoints, there are police, but those police are really just checkpoint police. I mean, the real muscle are still the militias. And so you're going through this very ritzy neighborhood of um, High Andalus where there's all these shopping stores. It's controlled by uh, a Zintani militia, basically. You'll see the police, but it, everyone knows that it's a factional um, you know, regionally based militia that's basically got this piece of real estate. Other towns are, there's normalcy. I mean, for instance, Sabrata. But again, how is security being managed in that town? It's, a, it's an arrangement between militias, a military council, a municipal council. And so is it the sort of state that we would like? It, it is a form of governance and authority that appears very normal. But as we've seen from the outbreaks of fighting, it can quickly um, collapse. And that's what people you know, are afraid of. You have to be very careful uh, in knowing where you are in the city. And of course, these things can flare up if some militia decides that he wants to go after somebody that did something wrong to him. So it's, it's I think, tenuous. So. Super, that helps a lot. Kareem, over to you with the same broad question to just help us understand Libya today in whichever dimension you want to emphasize, politics, security, economics. Over to you, my friend. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. Thank you for, 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 for for your introduction. Thank you for hosting this, this hard work that we put. And thank Mike for your, your leadership. There's one point that I would like to stress about the report, which is the premise from which we, we start from. It, it is very important that we understand that all our efforts are geared toward helping or supporting the Libyan people in their march towards what was the target of the revolution to begin with. That is, the acquired dignity for its population, freedom, human rights, and the plural, pluralist political system. That's something that we tend to forget, especially in, in the last few months when, when the talk is about the Bonapartist solution, the general who comes and takes control, better, better the strongman than, than anything else. All, all, all those chit chats that, that we have seen happening around is something that we did not take into consideration much. We really want to, pro to project a, a future for Libya, which is one of a difficult path, but tending towards, I don't want to say democracy, but towards a pluralist, constitutionally based political system because I think that the Libyans deserve that. And, and we cannot also forget the sacrifice that has been done by thousands of people to reach that point. This is one of, one of the premises which I think it's very important that, that, that we make because upon this are based many other recommendations that, that, that we do. Now to the, to, to the local level, the, the new approach is important because it goes to, to give a value to uh, the, the local roots of of the Libyan population, which after the fragmentation and the collapse of the state resorted to the local entity and, and worked it out. In, may, in, in most cities, in most places, the, the local authorities have handled the situation, have assured protection, have, have worked. So it will be important for the international community to understand these dynamics and go down to strengthen these, these forces to train, to prepare, to finance, to support, in any way. But I would like also here to stress another point, which is all of this, it works, as Fred brilliantly said, only if we insert all the actions that we do at the local level into the national framework. We don't want a state of city states, of city of village states, actually, more the case, each one against the other, or in a, in, a, in a sort of a non-belligerent situation. We want a national, count, a national country. We want, we want a state that is decentralized, and that's the strength of our report, is that there will never be a state where, in order to build 
a building in Tobruk, you have to go to Tripoli to ask the permission or, or, or the plan. This is decentralized, but within a national context. Because, because otherwise we will not have a state, the, the modernity project will, will not go ahead, and the authorities that, uh, that are there to ensure the rights, the freedoms that the Libyans fought for will, will not be able to, to, to provide it. This is, I think, the most important point that the Libyans are trying to get, especially from, 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 from a report by, like, like this. What is that the United States and, and, and the other allies can do for them? And this can be done and obtained only if the, the direction is very clear. There is no neocolonialism. There is no attempt of, of imposing a foreign order into the Libyan state. It is something that, in my, in my opinion, I always go back to the moment of independence where, thanks to the help of the United Nations and Adrian Pelt and the support of the United States behind that, Libya was given independence and became a state. The strategy was to guide the Libyans to do their job. Libyans gained their independence. Libyans de demonstrated for, the, for independence, but the guidance was there, was coming from, 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 from foreign support and from foreign help that allowed the process to, to finish and complete independence. There is no difference except for the, the changing of times in the principles today where the United Nations should lead the Libyans to do their job, to do their, their to put their acts together and, and, and find a solution for, for the country. And, and, and that is why we do talk about the, uh, la, wider American interest in Libya. Not because we expect the Americans to come and do something, but because we really need the superpower, the country that it is perceived as the least in interested in the exploitation of the resources of Libya, to come and help the United Nations to guide the country through this very difficult moment. Whether that, that will end up in an agreement between the two the two, polar, the, two, the two different poles, the one the, 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 the GNA and the other one in, in, led by Haftar and, and, and the HR, or, or it will be a different way, still we have to, to understand that that guidance is essential. If that is understood, then all the other recommendations will fit into, into place and will be understood as a more organic and dynamic way to bring a solution political, peaceful solution to the struggle that is going on now. If we don't understand that, and don't accept that, it will not work. Thank you. Thank you, Kareem, very much. And, and before we get into the detailed discussion of the recommendations, I wanted to ask Jeff and then Fetty and Alice to also give whatever additional snapshot uh, they may wish of conditions today in Libya. And, and Jeff, I know that you're in touch with some of your UN former colleagues and tracking some of what's happening on the ground and in the region, if you could perhaps pick up a little bit and give us just a sense of recent activity on that front. Uh, the Special Representative Salami has now been in Libya more than a year and a half, I believe, with his American def Deputy Stephanie Williams, who was helpful to us with this project with some background information. Uh, you know these people very well and are in touch. I wondered if you could add a word, please. Um, thank, uh, th thank you very much, and thanks, Mike, for the leadership of this of this project. And of course, it's an honor to be here in front of everyone, and especially just within the presence of the ambassador. So, thank you very much for for um, being here, Ambassador. Um, I think we all recognize, that, um, as as Fred as Fred mentioned, that we need some kind of that the Libya needs some kind of agreement among the Libyan elite, among the top among the top leaders, the competing the competing leaders, and you need and you need something from the ground up that would support that leader. You can't have one without the other. Um, and Ghassan Salami, the UN special envoy, the UN special representative for Libya, the head of the UN um, mission in Libya, UNSMIL, has been working on both of those fronts. And I, I believe that he views the February 27th meeting in Abu Dhabi between um, the 
Prime Minister, the head of the, of the recognized government in Tripoli, Fayez Siraj, and General um, Khalifa Hiftar, um, as a promising start of at least getting that top-down part of the agreement in place. And I understand that there's been meetings between people associated with, Hef with General Heftar and Prime Minister Siraj about some of the long-standing um, political proposals, such as, such as reform of the, of the Presidency Council, um, unification of the, of the institutions, perhaps a new government, things like that. But what, and moving toward elections. As the report itself says, election, as our report itself says, elections themselves do not create a democracy. Um, but elections are a way to manage expectations. The, it, poll after poll shows that the Libyan, the Libyan people expect to be able to express their own view and choose their own leaders through elections. So there seems to be an understanding, at least at the top, that the goal does have to be elections, even if the time for that um, isn't yet stated because there has to be a number of things that fall into place first. There still is talk, as we mentioned in, in this, about the idea of, an, of a national conference to try to build more of a consensus among a broader number of people than simply the two gentlemen I mentioned um, about, about, the way for, about the way forward. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Fetty, you've been thinking about Libya for a long time and putting it in historical perspective, and I just wondered you know, again, not to ask you to do the impossible and paint the entire picture of the country today, just what strikes you the most about the moment we're in now when you put it in the context of Libya's history uh, over, the, over the decades? Okay. Uh, first of all, thank you for uh, being here, and uh, thank you to the ambassador, and thank you to the Italian embassy to be here also. Um, I know that our work, which has been very mm, hard, uh, has been very well welcomed in uh, Libya and in Italy. So uh, that's a good start, first of all. Um, to answer to your question, uh, I see many, many things uh, similar to the past in Libya, and this is one of the point of uh, the major discussion between me and Karim Mezran, uh, because he thinks, uh, you know, in, in a different way in many respects. But I, I see um, some of the ethnic, uh, some of the tribal differences still uh, in the country. Uh, not just because still the concept of tribe uh, is strong in Libya, but just because the, the, the core of the people uh, is pretty the same. Um, the majority of the people are still in the big cities. Um, and then there is the desert, which has never changed, uh, and uh, that has shaped uh, the, 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 the people. Uh, so I think that mm, when we started to uh, approach uh, uh, this, uh, this study, uh, what I tried to do was to, to, to give my, my knowledge of, uh, of, uh, of Libya in historical terms. And this, the, the, the idea of uh, a city-based uh, based, uh, model is just uh, deep in history. So uh, Libya has always been a, a kind of hybrid um, in this uh, in this regard, so uh, we we really uh, started the approach uh, uh, thinking um, with enormous respect and, and knowledge of the Libyan history. So, just one follow up before I turn to Alice, and then we'll go to the second round with discussion of the main recommendations. But one of the things that we went through in the paper and the thinking about the basic concept that you helped us understand, and Kareem and others also, was that we did not want to think of a future Libyan government as a federal model based on the oh, yeah. three traditional regions, that, that we thought there was actually more to lose than to gain from that sort of framework. Could you explain why? Yes. Again, I'm sure some people in the room know, but others may not. Okay, so I, th the question is right, because uh, Mike knows better than anyone that my first idea uh, for Libya was about federalism, and still it is. So my, I know that I think in a different way here at this table, but I think, think, I, I think that uh, federalism is the solution for a democratic Libya in the future, which means not the three uh, classical uh, uh, regions, 
Cyrenaica, uh, Tripolitania, and Fezzan, uh, because it would have been possible, of course. Uh, Libya had its own federalism from 1951 with the king, and it was divided in, let's say, three regions. Um, what I see for Libya, it's uh, a, a, a federal state more similar to, just to let you know, as I wrote in one of my articles, uh, Germany or Switzerland. So, but with a strong, anyway, center uh, able to govern uh, uh, the state. Um, anyway, in uh, in our discussions uh, in in, this, in the last few months. Um, the idea of federalism was left away because, of course, the, the nation is still uh, in, a, you know, in, in a kind of uh, process. So uh, the idea of federalism, is, it's, it's not possible in this very moment. And uh, the city-based model was the best uh, um, in order to create a nation which has still to be uh, active. Thank you. Alice, could you just paint a picture for us a little bit of the state of security forces in Libya today uh, and whatever else you want to observe about current conditions? And again, you were involved in the earlier effort around 2013 to try to create a general purpose force, which was a difficult approach. And in terms of trying to create a national army, perhaps didn't completely succeed. But there have been elements of police and coast guard and uh, there's been perhaps some progress there and something to build upon, but just how do you see the whole complex mix of militias, police, uh, Coast Guard, any fledgling army that may still be around and how, uh, you know, how this has evolved over recent years? Sure, thanks Mike, and I'll, I'll go quickly because I'm sure the audience is eager to get at us as well. Um, so primarily I think we started out with an observation that the uh, the primary security institution in Libya today is really the militia, um, which is not to say that there aren't other um, government-organized uh, security institutions as well, but the real uh, power over uh, the use of armed force in Libya is this vast collection of militias that are extremely variable in their size and shape uh, and power and territory. Um, and ideological commitments and economic leverage, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so there's really no national form of security provision on the ground in Libya today. And so we started from a recognition of that and from a recognition of the fact uh, that control over security provision is a major source of power and a major source of political power. Um, and so I think uh, one observer asked the question about whether there was a government with militias or militias with governments. Um, and so we began from that sort of perspective, um, as well as the observation that certainly General Haftar and his Libyan National Army has consolidated the most, but that is not to say that it is fully consolidated. Um, and so there is a lot of uh, dynamism on the ground in terms of security. And that this therefore generates um, an, a major aspect of that decentralization that we see in terms of politics and power um, and the kind of self-reliance that obtains on the ground in Libya today. Um, and that one element of that, though I think a small one from Libyan's perspective, but a large and important one from an American perspective, is the presence of the Islamic State. Um, which the United States has partnered with Libyans on the ground to combat. Um, much of the elements of IS have been um, forced to the south, um, but they are still, still a presence on the ground and will therefore be a major animating element of U.S. policy going forward. And I think I'll stop there and let us continue the conversation. Thank you. So now I'd like to begin with Jeff and talk about the major recommendations of the report. And just, I'm going to very quickly tick them off, but let the panelists describe them and then uh, explain the rationale. Uh, we think that the United States should return a permanent diplomatic and AID presence to Libya. Uh, and this could be a very important element of supporting everything else we believe in. As you can see from the title, we believe that we should encourage the United Nations system and Libyans themselves to formalize the way in which cities are often at the heart of development activity and governance and try to create mechanisms that are a little more transparent and a little more systematic. Some of this is happening already, but it's somewhat haphazard and entrepreneurial and not always uh, evident what, what the rules are, how the central government tries to work with the various cities and neighborhoods, 
we'd like to see that process become a little bit more uh, sort of constant and steady and dependable so that people know the rules of the game and there's a sense of fairness and a sense of, again, transparency and confidence around it. We believe the United States needs to help work with other outside players, including the key players from Europe, Italy and France, key players from the broader region, uh, the UAE, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Turkey, and even Russia, to try to deconflict the role of outside powers because there's an element of proxy war and proxy competition that's been going on that we think has to be contained if there's going to be hope for everything else. We also uh, talk about how militias can be encouraged and incentivized to respect certain kinds of rules of the road. And some of them are doing some of this already, others not so much. And we think there is an important emphasis that needs to be added to make this kind of thing happen more widespreadly because it's not realistic to start from the ground and just build a Libyan army from scratch, we don't think. That Libyan army is gonna have to emerge to some extent by stitching together through regional commands some of the militia efforts and maybe some of the pieces like Coast Guard uh, as well. And so we'll talk about that. And then finally, some of us, but not all, believe that if Libyans themselves come to this conclusion and request this from the United Nations system, that the United Nations should consider sanctioning a modest-sized uh, peace implementation force of some kind or another, not for nationwide security, but for some of the key government institutions, oil production, other infrastructure. This could uh, perhaps help create a little more confidence as well in terms of the degree to which the militias are respecting rules because the UN presence could also, the UN security presence could also provide monitoring and provide reports. I should emphasize that only about half the people on this panel and less than half the people in the task force uh, actually advocated this idea. Some thought it might be fine, but that it was pie in the sky, that Libyans wouldn't want it, wouldn't request it, or the international community wouldn't be willing to provide it. Others thought that it might not even actually achieve good results on the ground if deployed, so we'll have some discussion of that later on. That's the sort of swing variable in the report that not everyone endorsed. But without further ado, let me ask the individual panelists to pick up these or other key recommendations, explain them in a little more detail, uh, and take a few minutes each to sort of hone in on one idea piece. Jeff, starting with you, if I could. Thanks, Mike. Um, of course, this report is about a U.S. approach. The, the report is giving options for, the, for U.S. policymakers to consider um, policy ideas for, for them to debate. The, the major questions have to, be, have to be answered by the Libyans about what sort of state ultimately that they're going, they're going to have. So these are recommendations about the U.S. And the one that I find um, particularly important is one that Mike mentioned earlier, which is a return of a permanent U.S. presence inside the country. Now, this is not to minimize the diplomacy that the U.S. has done since 2012. You know, there's been a lot of work outside Libya that's, that's been done. There's been Libyan leaders have been received in, have been received in Washington, which which gives them a certain profile. There's been discussions between American officials and European officials, Arab officials. Um, about about Libya, and of course, there's been there's been CT work. I also want to highlight that AID, through its partners, has done a lot of, of very dynamite work on the ground, um, consistent with the city-based approach that we're outlining. So this is not to minimize what the U.S. has done since 2012. When when we advocate, it's time to have a permanent presence inside Libya again. Now, I I when I'm, I look at this with three points. Uh, I come from three points when I, when I advocate with my colleagues returning a U.S. Um, embassy mission to Libya. First, in the six years that I worked for the U.N., I saw that one of the essential elements for those U.N. envoys, U.N. special representatives who were successful was a strong daily partnership with the U.S. It's very difficult to have that strong daily partnership with Ghassan Salami and his team when one isn't located in Libya as he is. You know, the sort of just the, the, the comfort level of daily interaction um, on all sorts of details isn't, isn't there. Um, and the UN does have the lead given by the Security Council with votes by the United States for doing the outside facilitation to help the Libyans um, answer some of the questions before them. So first point, UN envoys, representatives are successful when they have 
or an essential element of their success is, is, is a close partnership, which is only possible if they're physically located in proximity. Second is a point that um, the ambassador made in her comments, U.S. credibility in Libya. That, the U, that um, I guess a virtue perhaps of not being on the ground since 2012 was that the, the U.S. hasn't been seen as, quote, interfering or after oil or whatever some of the rumors were initially in 2011, the U.S. does have credibility. It's time to use that credibility on the ground in Libya. Third point, the U.S. has a track record of success. We saw last summer when there was a, when there was a crisis in the oil crescent that U.S. diplomacy made the essential, was the essential element in resolving that oil crescent crisis, which had revenue issues that would have affected the entire country. So there's a track record of success when the U.S. does use its diplomatic mu muscle. Now, for diplomatic engagement about Libya, one needs to have the outside diplomacy, how you work with the Europeans, how you help resolve differences between, say, France and, and Italy or the Emirates and Turkey, the Emirates and Qatar about Libya. The U.S is really the only, the only player that can resolve those sorts of differences. You can do that outside. You don't need to have the presence inside to do that. But you also need the inside diplomacy. And the inside diplomacy inside Libya has both the top-down elements and the bottom-up elements. Now, arguably, perhaps without a presence, the U.S. could do some of the top-down stuff. You can receive Libyan leaders in the mission in Tunis. There can be occasional visits by American officials to Tripoli and elsewhere to see leaders. You can receive leaders in, in Washington. So maybe you know, one could argue that maybe you can do some of the top-down diplomacy from outside the country. But you certainly can't do the bottom-up diplomacy from outside the country. You're not going to have the range of contacts um, to really be able to um, help shape or, or encourage support for any top, for any top down um, agreements that might be made among the, among the Libyan elite. And you're not going to have that same comfort level in talking to people if you only see them occasionally. I think those of us that have served, served in diplomatic missions recognize that when you have your first couple conversations with, some, with someone, that the person you're seeing wants to make sure you understand his or her narrative. So it's going to be more or less the narrative, whatever that whatever that person's political position is, whatever that person's political history is, um, and whatever that person's proposal is, it's only after you get to know somebody through multiple meetings can you start having the type of give and take that really leads to an understanding on your side of of what you know. In this case, the U.S. might be able to consider um, supporting, and to give you the type of influence and credibility needed. So, so for, the, for the purposes of the bottom-up diplomacy that's going to be essential to the success of any top-down agreement, I think the U.S. needs to be present on the ground in addition to the work that the U.S. has been doing from outside. Fantastic. Very cogent and clear. And Fred, if I could go to you next, uh, you could, if you like, pick up where Jeff left off or go to another major recommendation. But one thing I would ask you to comment on, which I'm sure is on the minds of some people who have heard this proposal now, is to assess the, the degree of danger that would be associated with a permanent UN presence, uh, or U.S. presence, excuse me. Obviously, the reason we left is because of the killing of a U.S. ambassador in Libya in 2012 and the, the sense of a, of, of a climate and uh, environment of danger that was not consistent with having a diplomatic presence on the ground. So how do we assess the risk of a possible return, as well as anything else you'd want to discuss, please? I mean, that's always a, a danger. And, you know, I'm, I'm reminded when I drove by the, uh, the foreign ministry in, in, uh, in Tripoli of these, you know, burned out uh, windows and, and, and you know, burned out cars where ISIS had just uh, attacked on, on December 25th. So the, the threat is very real there. Um, you know, diplomats and, and contractors and NGOs are, are generally quartered in a, in a villa complex by the sea. There is still somewhat of a sort of, you know, green zone fortress-like mentality. So there's a real force protection concern. But, um, you know, as Jeff knows, you have to balance this with getting out and, you know, doing your job. And I think that's a calculated risk that diplomats you know, they, they weigh that when they do that. So, um, you know, there is, there is, as I mentioned, a degree of sort of normalcy in, in Tripoli. Um, again, I think it's going to have to come down to, to a calculated, you know, trade-off in terms of 
of the, the value of our presence. And I think we need to be there. I mean, the British are there, the Italians, the UN, so, so I, we're not there. And, and having meetings in Tunis, it creates a different dynamic. I mean, I think sometimes when Libyans go to Tunis to meet, it's sort of a different, you know, meeting them in the country is a completely different, you know, set of circumstances. You really need to be present. Um, let me turn to my, my uh, point on a recommendation. This city-based model of, of security, again, security provision, what do we mean? A degree of security for people um, that allows them to get on with their lives, the administration of justice, conflict resolution. I think the report recognizes that this is going on at the local level um, in, in multiple towns where you have a combination of official forces working with uh, militias under the rubric of a military council, working with uh, tribal mediators, wise men delegation, working with business elites. And so in some cases you've got this arrangement um, that works in terms of giving people a degree of security. And so the question we we raise is how do you grow that? How do you formalize it? How do you, um, you know, scale it up? How do you tether it to a national authority? Because as Kareem mentioned, we don't want to uh, create a, a, a system of sort of separate city-states. Um, but again, I think there are a number of positive um, trends underway at the local level where towns often find a way to get along. There are um, negotiated settlements uh, between various tribal uh, delegations. Um, I think in, in terms of the broader security architecture, it's very interesting to me that at the sort of national level, the, the army unification project that was shepherded by Egypt is stuck. Again, because of that political division between those elites, Siraj and, and Heftar. But at the local policing level, as I understand it, there's quite a lot of interchange between Benghazi and between Tripoli. There's actually delegations, there's exchanges, and that shows me that at the local level, again, getting down to the sort of nuts and bolts of governance, Libyans are getting things done. And, and so how do we support that effort through this city-based uh, governance approach? Again, we're talking about growing locally constituted forces for policing, rather than trying to insert a new uh, sort of centralized military force on top of it, you, you want to sort of grow it up, formalize it. Again, you're not encouraging um, warlordism or militias, but you're, you're taking advantage of a trend that is, that is already there at the municipal level. And I think that's a valuable um, uh, aspect of the report. I think we also make the very valuable recognition that expecting militias to simply disarm uh, through a weapons buyback program or simply giving them jobs is not going to work. This is not a technical solution. It requires a political compact. It's going to be a gradual iterative uh, process. So I think the, the section on, on DDR is, is worth reading as well. So. Super. Thank you very much. Kareem, again, over to you, my friend. And please highlight for us uh, an aspect of the recommendations that you would consider most central to what Libya needs today into your thinking. Thank you very much, Mike. I have just one thing to say before. The, the Americans did not evacuate the embassy because of the death of the ambassador in Benghazi, Ambassador Stevens. They left because of the clashes that were happening in 2014 between the Libya Dawn, in, in, in contrast to the Karama operation of of Haftar in the, in, the, in the East. And this is important for one thing. They did not bow or, or were afraid of the terrorist attack against their compound. They were afraid of for the security of the whole mission in a moment in which forces from outside the city and inside the city started fighting. This may help us coming to the conclusion that that Jeff and Fred told, that it is important for the Americans to be back because if they are there now, they, they could constitute another restraint for the militias to, to, to attack each other or to move against, uh, against each other as they have done. This is important to notice, to add to the various re re reasons that, that, that have been advocated for, for an American return. It, it, it can have a very important stabilizing effect, at least in my, in my opinion, because it will prevent or help preventing a major uproar. This is one. Yeah, the, the, the other point that I know Mike wants 
me to, to talk about is the cross that I've been carrying for, 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 for many years about the foreign intervention, foreign support forces. I never thought of, of an invasion like that of Iraq or a strong presence like it's up in Afghanistan. What the international community could have done was supply a force of support for, for those forces in Libya that, 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 that would be acting in favor of the government. It would have been great if this was happening in 2014, if for some illumination, some foreign pen could have intervened and blocked what was going on in Tripoli and in Benghazi. That didn't happen, okay. 2016, again, when Serraj went to Tripoli without any support, that was the moment to provide for him a, a support force that would allow for the protection of the infrastructure, of the physical government members, guarantee secu security with the Libyan forces on the ground for the city, and from there, continue. That, 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 that is all a, a support force could do. And I still today, I don't see it as a provocation to the Libyans or a rea popular reaction and outcry against it. Because we know that when somebody comes to help, that help has to be negotiated, has to be discussed, but has to be received. And, and, the, and this international force studied the, the, the way we want, formed form by countries to be determined. It is important, and it would have been very important in 2016 to prevent the argument, which was a, a legitimate and, 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 and unbeatable argument from coming from the East, where the new parliament regularly elected and the new leadership said, but how can we accept anything that is happening in Tripoli when this government is un, at, the, at the mercy of the same militias that we are fighting, the same forces that we are against? This was an unbeatable argument who, who helped very much the creation of a polarized situation in which they said we cannot believe anything that comes from the West because of this state of affairs in, on the ground. And therefore, we do our own state. We do our own activities. We, we do our own. That was what helped in, in large part the, this, this polarization that, 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 that has de facto killed also any attempt by the United Nations to resolve it. because. In front of such a, a, an objection, Bernardino Leon, Cobbler, and now Salame have no answer. They cannot, they cannot defend, in effect, the idea of a government that is protected by the same militias against which half of the country is fighting. Is fighting. That, therefore, on, on, only for that reason, I was, and I've always been in favor of a third party. Moreover, scholarship helps as Bruce Jones showed, showed, showed us many times in our meetings, we said that only in one case, I think, a civil war was resolved without a foreign a third party intervention. These are statistics, scholarship, give it the, the value you want, but it is important. It is very difficult for local entities fighting with each other to create a situation of compromise such as, in such a way that, 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 that a step forward can be done without some form of third party intervention. Thank you. Thank you, Kareem. Fetty, if I could go to you next, and you can feel free to say whatever you like, but one, one issue I hope you'll address will include the role of various outside players. And uh, we're very proud here at Brookings that we are helping France and Italy work together. Uh, we've got, we, we've got a t two young scholars, uh, Celia Belin, and Giovanna De Meo, who have been writing together about how they can handle their broader uh, dispute right now, which extends well beyond the Libya question. But this sort of is a, a good way to get a handle on some of the complexities of the role of outside powers in Libya today. And we know that the United States has been remiss, I think, in some ways, not to give enough attention to the problem. Italy and France are somewhat competitive with each other, and a number of Middle Eastern states are competitive with each other, and now Russia's got an eye on the prize as well, so to speak. And I wondered if you could speak to how uh, a new strategy might try to deconflict the role of the various outside players. Yes. Um, in, in, in the paper, we tried to put together two different approaches. 
One uh, was uh, exactly the, the you, Jeff, uh, talk about that, the inside-out approach, so giving strength to uh, the United Nations mission and uh, Qassam Salame. And the other one uh, was exactly what, what you're asking for, so the outside-in approach, uh, which means the United States uh, uh, in a role not of a gendarmerie, let's say, but something like this, because maybe in Europe we need this. Um, and so trying to get a balance uh, between uh, the many interests uh, in the field. So one of, uh, as we know, there are many actors, uh, many foreign players in Libya. Libya is very interesting for many, uh, in many respects, uh, because of the strategical position, of course, which is important for the Maghreb, for Africa, and uh, for the Mediterranean. So, um, first of all, so the position. Uh, secondly, uh, energy. Uh, Libya has uh, huge uh, uh, deposits and oil fields, and uh, the oil, the Libyan oil, is probably the best in the world and uh, the, the, the easiest to be uh, treated. So um, Europe has a problem with energy, and uh, in this way, France uh, and Italy as, are extremely interested in, uh, in the Libyan uh, oil, S and, and gas also, of course. Um, third, there is another problem, migration. So not only Libyan migration, but the African migration. So Africa is, is a, in, a, is in a continent in a explosion, in demographic explosion, with a huge problem of climate change. So um, Libya, an uncontrolled Libya, can be really the door for uh, this kind of migration to Europe. And Europe, at the moment at least, is not well prepared to welcome and to um, uh, manage uh, masses of people, of course. So uh, between, for example, just because I'm Italian, uh, the problem uh, between the Italian government and the, the, the French government is huge in this case. And so what the United States could do is really um, trying to, uh, to, to be the diplomat in this sense and to help uh, these two countries and all of course these two countries in uh, you know in coming to agreements because the foreign intervention in Libya in the in the last 8 years has been huge and has made many um, has created many problems many problems so adding uh, further problems to what Libyans uh, already have of course um, and so I think that uh, I remember uh, the first meeting I had with Secretary Mattis was exactly, uh, his question was for Libya, what can I do for you? <laughs> and I said, the, I think that the first thing you can do is to help us as nations, uh, as France and Italy, for example, to come to some agreement in, in the country because we are damaging a lot uh, the peace process in Libya, with our uh, interests, of course, and uh, so uh, that was uh, that is present in uh, in uh, in uh, the paper, and uh, I think it's a very good reason to for the U.S. to be to be there, active and really operating. Super, thank you, and I hope everyone's getting their questions ready because now I'm going to turn to Alice and then to you. And Alice, I'd just like to ask you, of course, to speak to whichever recommendations in the report you would like to emphasize, but certainly including <coughs> the case of security sector reform and what our vision would be there, our suggestion that Libyans might consider. Yeah, absolutely. I think Fred covered our perspective on the militias um, and DDR really well. And so I'll just add on top of that, um, that in this course of legitimizing uh, militias, which have very uneven performance uh, along that metric, um, the idea is also to professionalize them. And so you'll see a proposal in here for some kind of a national charter that sets national professional standards for security forces that are things like subordination to government control and support for local government, as well as national government, uh, respect for human rights, um, as well as commitments um, to essentially avoid and eschew 
uh, corruption issues and management of local economic production as well. Um, and so under those sort of three br big rubrics, we would see some kind of um, national level charter that such groups would sign up to, and part of the incentive to signing up would be outside support from the United States and others. Um, and hopefully the, uh, all good things would snowball, and over time, as you legitimized these forces and they became more and more professional and more and more competent, you could slowly, as Michael has put it, stitch them together um, into a uh, truly, uh, into truly national coverage of security. At the same time, uh, we discuss also ensuring that you develop uh, forces with national missions such as border protection, such as oil infrastructure protection, such as protection of uh, national infrastructure and um, governing sites and so forth, so that you really do get this top-down, bottom-up approach in the security sector that really works with what is organic to Libya right now and what the Libyans are de facto legitimizing. We would like to come in and see how to de jure legitimize it and make it sustainable. Fantastic, thank you all. So now please uh, have your questions and thoughts ready. And what I'll do is try to take two or three at a time and then turn back to the panel and not ask each person to, to respond to each question, but whichever one uh, strikes you as the most relevant. So we'll, if we could start here in the uh, front, or the fourth row, I'm sorry. And then there's also a hand in about the eighth row. Okay, we'll, we'll stay up here for a minute. Go ahead, sir. I'm David, I'm, I'm David Mack from the Middle East Institute. I'm very pleased to be here. I'm very pleased to see an old friend, Ambassador Wafa. Um, but it was in this very room in 2011 or 2012, I don't remember exactly when, when a Libyan leader came here, rolled out the roadmap that some of the, that he and some of his colleagues had developed. This was what we called the Transitional National Council the um, El Majlis of Watani El Intikali. And he had already done this in Paris with Hillary Clinton. Really impressed her. And then he did it here in public and impressed a lot of us. And we thought, wow, the Libyans really have their act together. All they gotta have is a little bit of support internationally and they're gonna really make this post Gaddafi Libya happen. Now, if you read uh, the, the very good book that Fred Wary has written, you get a little understanding of why this went so wrong. But, so, you read his book, you'll know why he thinks it went wrong. Why do other people up there think that matters deteriorated so much from that promising beginning. Um, and there'll be different answers to that, and I look forward to hearing your answers. Thank you, and we'll stay on this side and hear the gentleman in the third row, please, and then the gentleman in the fifth row, and then we'll come back to the panel. My name is Jop Matz. I work for the Libyan Institute for Advanced Studies. Uh, the question on the Oversight Committee, there's clearly an interesting idea on the security side to build certain charters and uh, make sure that the militia are constructive in the maintenance of local security. Uh, was there an idea to take it further in, in the policy area and to look at the economic side and how to actually build a social contract? And are there examples from other countries where um, that issue was successfully pursued? I mean, I've heard of Chad um, where there were some initiatives in the World Bank to pull things together. Are there other ideas, maybe Mr. Feldman would have ideas, on, on where that has succeeded? Um, obviously in Libya there's a concern about too much uh, foreign interference. I would very much like to know that. Thank you, and then we'll take one more. Sean, yeah, back there. Thank you so much, Eduardo Pascual. Um, I'm curious about uh, what would be the lesson learned from the last eight years if you need to give an advice to present situation now in Algeria, you're having a big mess on the western border of Libya, and uh, I would like, uh, well, I would like to know if there's something that uh, the present government could be done to not go into the same mistakes that happened in, in Libya. Okay, with the uh, caveat that I'm not sure how much we're going to solve Algeria today as well, but. 
but, but I still appreciate the question. So why don't we begin with Allison, just work down the row to whichever questions people would like to respond to. Um, I'm going to put on my political scientist hat uh, to answer the first question, which is that, you know, mo most international problems have multiple different drivers. And so we're all on this panel going to probably have different drivers that we identify. Um, I am going to, um, I don't know if it's optimism, but I'm going to be the one that says I have studied the state formation literature a lot that Fred alluded to. And uh, state formation actually takes a really, really long time. So on one level, for us in the international community to expect Libya, which was uh, coming from a position of having a strong man that systematically uh, did not empower and enable the kinds of institutions and institutional expertise that you would want to see in order for a state to continue, um, to be coming out of that history, for us to expect them to have a nice, stable governance structure within eight years, and to have worked out all of its politics that had been suppressed for decades is perhaps unrealistic. Um, and so I think I'll just lay it there that maybe it's not that um, everything fell apart and nothing worked, it's just that nothing has worked itself out yet. Great, thanks for that. Very well said. Betty. I agree with Alice, and uh, I would like to add something about this. Um, for sure, uh, the international community was incredibly ignorant about uh, Libyan history. And uh, so the mistake was just uh, to believe that maybe in a couple of years, uh, okay, we can have Libya from nothing. That's the point. So how many, if you think uh, uh, of our history, um, and so I asked the ambassador not to be depressed, about this. I mean, uh, it's a long time. If you want to get democracy, which is an incredibly fragile uh, creature, you need a, a lot of time. If you look at our uh, democratic uh, histories, if you look at the history of the United States or history of Italy, uh, for example, of, or of Europe, France, how many blood? How many uh, decades, centuries uh, uh, were needed to build a nation? So um, I think, and I wrote that in many, many times, that we, when, we thought, uh, when we think about Libya, we must be really patient. And uh, not to be depressed, I mean, uh, um, Libya is, uh, as the ambassador were uh, telling, is a, a, a very particular country uh, with few people, very different. Even though the religion is, is the same, they are incredibly different because uh, the distances are huge and uh, the influences come from different places. So uh, I think that they need to find their, 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 their way and of course they need to be helped, but just from the outside. So uh, if uh, we, we think if we want a democratic Libya, it will take a lot of time and efforts and uh, a, a little bit uh, less intervention from uh, the foreign uh, actors, I think. Thank you, Jeff, over to you. Thank you. David, good to see you. And, um, my own take on what happened in 2011, because I was with Hillary Clinton in the, in the meetings with Mahmoud Jalil in Paris, and then with Hillary Clinton after the, after the fall of Tripoli, with Susan Rice after the fall of Tripoli, and my own trips, um, both, in, both to Benghazi in August of 2011, when the fight for Tripoli was just beginning, and then as Assistant Secretary of State to Tripoli um, in the fall after the, after the fall of Gaddafi. My own sense is that there was complacency on the part of the, the Libyan leaders of the Transition and National Council, whether we're talking about Abdul Jalil or Mahmoud, Jib or Mahmoud Jibril, that, that they had this, you know, they had this sense of, of victory for obvious reasons, a sense of historic destiny for obvious reasons, and they didn't feel they needed the type of outside support that might have, in hindsight, hindsight's 2020 vision, obviously, that might have that might have spelled a difference. I remember, I remember lots of meetings with Libyan leaders at the time, both before the fall of Tripoli and after the fall of Tripoli, where as a U.S. official then, I would talk to them about what, what is it that, that you need? What is it, where should we be looking to bring in outside help? What should the U.N. be doing? And it was, we've got this under control, was the basic, was the basic attitude. I think that there was complacency, and there was a fear, 
I think as well, and I, 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 I defer to, to the ambassador and Kareem on, on, on what Libyans actually think, but I think that there was also a fear by some that if they invited the type of international support that, 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 that some have now advocated at that time, that it would have given their opponents the perfect tool to say, see, this war was about grabbing our oil. This war was about undermining Libyan sovereignty. So I think there was both a complacency and a fear. In terms of the Oversight Committee, I think all of us were very well aware of this, this um, of the possibility, the potential to have Libyans, um, spoilers, accuse outsiders of wanting to control Libyan assets, wanting to control Libyan oil, Libyan revenue, et cetera. So when you look at how you know, the World Bank and the fund, op fund operate, you know, they, they have very strict conditionality that's based on fund and World Bank practices. This was something we, we looked at differently, which is how can you have something that, ha that gives credibility for Libyans who may suspect other Libyans of trying to skew the table in their direction, but also has Libyan ownership, that also makes sure that the Libyans are the ones that are, that are in um, a leadership position. So, that, so the oversight was sort of a hybrid of what's the conditionality that should be required, how do you bring in international um, expertise, best practices, but how do you make sure it has Libyan ownership? Well, I agree with everything that was said, and um, I'll just uh, add something on the, the economic uh, dimension to add to what Jeff said. Um, I mean, I think part of Libya's problem is, the, is it suffers from the pathologies of a rentier state. I mean, 90% or more of the population gets their income from the state. I mean, in some sense, this conflict is about you know, distribution of, of wealth. I mean, the sort of mask of ideology or politics as driving the struggle has sort of fallen away. And so you've got a huge culture of predation and plunder by elites and by militias. And so um, the question we try to address is, you know, how do we, how do we reduce the incentives for conflict? How do we fix that, that distribution, um, you know, problem? Um, again, I, I think there's, there's so much that needs to be done in terms of safeguarding and insulating key assets from militia control, whether it's banks, the foreign ministry, um, airports, ports, oil fields. Um, and I think this goes back to uh, Ambassador Mack's question about what went wrong. I think there was a real failure um, in the early stages of the liberation to secure you know, key assets from militia or factional um, control. I think there was a fatal decision by the transitional government to start funneling oil wealth to the militias, again, which created this, this juggernaut that we have um, today, that the fact that, um, I think by one count, there was, a, there was a European diplomat that said one out of every six males in Libya is getting their income for some sort of security provision, either militia or state. And so the, the entire security apparatus, informal or formal in Libya, is basically a wealth distribution mechanism to young men. And so untangling that is gonna be a huge challenge. It requires a political compact, but it also requires, I mean, job creation, diversification of the economy, um, and so forth. So, so we're faced with a, a huge uh, problem, and I think the report rightly addresses the economic dimension of it. <coughs> Thank you, Ron. I think that what went wrong happened in 2011. Because true democracy, democratization takes a long time, but the foundations have to be laid correctly. The first original sin was that of not recognizing that it was not a revolution of a whole people against a dictator and few mercenaries. Gaddafi had his support, had his part of the population that, that fought for him. Immediately after the, the victory, there should have been the recognition by the elites of the moment of the necessity to for a national reconciliation. It was barely talked about and, and, and then was ignored, but that should have been the first step to do. National reconciliation, what do we want for, for, for after this revolution? What kind of state, what kind of dynamics, what kind of identity do we foster? And, and all those questions should have been addressed at that moment. And of course, the second one was 
the fact that I don't think it's complacency. I am much more harsh on this. I think that there was a, a precise design by parts of the elites of the moment not to request any help or oversight or support from the West because they wanted to govern the country by themselves. In that moment, if the elite played the right card, and instead of saying it was only Libyans who did it, it was only us who did it, there was no important, and, and, and instead of underplaying the support coming from, from the West, emphasized it, it would have been the, a moment for, on, on the wave of success, on the, on the wave of the victory, to help Libya to disarm the militia and start a process of reconstruction with the correct step and not falling into the continuous mistakes. Uh, some of you made a reference, like paying the militia for appeasement, going to elections right away, which we, we know that elections do not solve the issue. They crystallize it. So at, the, at, the, at the point, they created the, the problem. And from there on, one mistake after the other, you, you get to the level where, where you are now, where the solution is, is extremely hard. So to answer, David, your question, I think that we, besides the problems of get the feedback, everything is there. But the two fatal mistakes that were done in 2011 are these two. And this is, in my opinion, the, the, the flaw, the problem, that the foundation of the new Libyan state was not laid correctly. So whatever we build up now, we have to take into consideration that it's not based on a correct procedure. Thank you, Kareem. Alice is going to say a word on Algeria, but first I'm going to add one additional thought, which is that while I certainly uh, accept everything that's been said from people who know the history and lived it and understand it much better than I, I want to add in an element of U.S. policy, which is not Jeff Feltman's fault, but the broader political climate in which the United States was operating in 2011 and 12, I think, needs to be kept in mind as well. We really didn't want to do much, and I personally can't claim that I was out there from a Brookings perspective uh, waving a lot of papers to advocate a different approach. But I do think, given how much we should have learned by this point about the difficulty of state building in situations where you overthrow a dictator and then chaos ensues, even if people on the ground don't think that they're going to need help, uh, the kinds of dangers that arise when you try to build new states should be better known to us than we could expect them to be well known to Libyans who didn't have all the experience from Iraq to Afghanistan to many other parts of the world. So I thought at a minimum we should have, with retro, you know, with the benefit of hindsight, in retrospect, should have been offering some strong suggestions and maybe even some incentives to accept certain kinds of help, best practices on how to build uh, election mechanisms that are not divisive but uh, partly unifying. Uh, best practices on how to start to build security forces in an environment where a state army has collapsed. I thought we owed the Libyans a little more than we gave them personally. Uh, and so I'll just add that perspective as well. And again, we were overwhelmed and we had a lot going on and I understand why President Obama didn't want to add one more responsibility and he thought NATO should be able to largely do it without us after Gaddafi was overthrown. But I still think that broader point about NATO's responsibility towards Libya should be put on the table as well. But Alice, uh, any thoughts you want to add on Algeria Yeah, in just swiftly, and I'm obviously, we've departed Libya at this point, but I, I do think that drawing comparisons between Libya today and what may happen in Algeria probably isn't too helpful because Algeria already had its civil war, which concluded in the early 1990s. Um, and also Algeria has a highly institutionalized security and intelligence services. Um, so I think that coupled with the fact that Bouteflika just uh, capitulated to the peaceful protests that um, the Algerians have been organizing for the last several weeks and said, okay, I will not run for another term, but I will stay on for an extra year. We'll see what happens. But, it, you know, in an ideal world, he could use that year to work out a good transition. Um, and certainly his own political faction and the security services have an interest in a stable transition. Um, the only thing I can think of for that, that would be a model for Algerians is that, say what you will, politics in Libya are truly playing out between Libyan actors, um, highly, a high degree of intervention from the outside world. Um, but, you know, one of the drivers of the, of the Algerian civil war 
um, was a sort of stalled effort um, at at um, at sort of um, electoral politics, essentially. And I'll, I'll leave it at that, but I, I think drawing comparisons between the two won't, won't get you very far, and so you should probably look elsewhere for examples for Algeria. So let's go to a second round of questions, and uh, we'll start with Giovanna, and then we've got a gentleman in about the eighth row, and then one here in the second row, and one in the first row to round it out. I have a question for Federica. Um, we talked about the U.S. role, but I was thinking, what about Italy due to the special historical ties with Libya? What, what would be the added value that Italy could bring to the table? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. My name is Nathaniel Kaler. I'm a researcher at Courage Services. Uh, my question regards uh, this, this idea of credibility. Uh, the pr report proposes using a U.S. credibility uh, as a tool to advance uh, Libyan security. Uh, how would you propose, or what would your thoughts be on the, the actors within Libya that can play a spoiler role that may view the United States uh, unfavorably? Uh, I'm thinking here uh, the Warfala, uh, the Farjan tribes, uh, which may not just view the U.S. unfavorably, but may view the United States as having taken a co-belligerent role in earlier times in the Civil War, uh, in involving itself, for example, within conflicts between the Misratans and the Warfala. So how do we extricate ourselves from, from that viewpoint, and uh, what would be your thoughts on maybe conciliati conciliating uh, or engaging with those actors? Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Maurizio Greganti. I am the Deputy Chief of Mission at the Embassy of Italy here in Washington. Uh, I have a comment and a question. Uh, the comment is that I feel in a way uh, necessary here to, to speak a little bit about Italy and France because they were mentioned a, a number of times. And we always um, hear people saying, you know, there, are, there is this rivalry, there is this big difference between Italy and France. I mean, I am a diplomat, but believe me what, in what I'm saying, this is largely a myth. I mean, people like to speak about it, that, you know, there is this big rivalry, you know, compounding the situation in Libya. I mean, we had disagreements with France, but now we speak almost daily about Libya, and we try to cooperate, and basically we have the main interest, uh, which is to stabilize the country. Uh, and this is uh, sincere from our side and from the French as well. I think I can speak for them as well. I think, I mean, maybe this is not, you know, very fancy to say, but that's the reality. Uh, and the basic uh, goal that we have is to stabilize Libya, really, uh, which means, as Karim was saying, uh, we want a, a, a pluralist political system for Libya in the future. We don't think that a strong man can solve it, if we ever uh, land there would be a mistake, and we are convinced about this. The question is, uh, I think that you are uh, presenting a very thoughtful and accurate and very reasonable strategy, but there are also a lot of uh, innovative ideas, very interesting. Um, and how do you see that this fits in the present UN strategy and the strategy that uh, Rassan Salame is, is, is pursuing, which to which we adhere and we strongly support, because I think this is uh, very important to, to understand. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. And maybe we should go back to the panel now. We'll save yours for a final round, uh, because we've already got a lot on the table. Those were very, very important comments and questions. So, uh, Kareem, shall we just start with you and work our way down and come back to the Italy-specific questions at the end, but start also with uh, the broader issues as well. I agree that from a diplomatic point of view, France and Italy are theoretically on the same side. But it's also true that when you go down to the ground in the last time, you, see, you, you have noticed a stronger French support for the eastern part, which we've seen through the accident of the famous helicopter with three special forces, French special forces troops who died that there has been an involvement in supporting Haftar. While, not, while 
continues to present the, uh, the face value of we support both governments. In this is where we see the difference. And in the recent, more recent policy of the French sponsoring the idea of elections as a way to stabilize Libya, which was not what the Italians were, on the other hand, preaching or talking, which was, no, you first stabilize the country, then you go to, to elections. These are the points that we have seen of contrast, which, from your point of view, the bigger sphere m might, be, m m might, be, might be marginal, but for, for us, if we observe, it, uh, it, it, it carries weight. It, uh, it has a certain importance. On, on, the, on that sense, we continue to insist on the rivalry, which I agree, it shouldn't be there, uh, uh, and it is on the way to be resolved in these days, but uh, for me, it, it definitely has, has been there. Why don't we stay on that point, and Fetty, come to you next, and ask you to add whatever comments you'd like, including to Giovanna's question as well, please, and sure. then we'll resume the other question. Uh, I agree with Karim, Maurizio, I'm sorry. Uh, and uh, I've always seen the river, if you want, uh, as you are, are absolutely right when you say we are not uh, in a conflict because we want the same things. Terrorism uh, is on plate and must be solved. Uh, migration for the two countries must be solved. Uh, energy is another problem. We can, uh, you know, find a deal, as we've already done in the past. So, said that, um, there is, a, a, in, in, in many, a, let's say, a political rivalry. So, uh, why, for example, as observers, we, we saw that, why these uh, endless conferences. Why? So, why Conte, Prime Minister Conte, the Italian Prime Minister, went out from uh, the meeting with Trump, uh, okay, now we are going to have uh, a conference uh, uh, in Palermo after the two conferences made by France uh, that took to nothing. So, this is our point. So this is just a, a, a loss of time in, in, in our opinion. And uh, we, we would like to see um, a real agreement, not only diplomatic, because I'm sure that there is, but just uh, on, uh, you know, in, in politics. Um, secondly, what Italy can do. Italy can do a lot uh, with a lot of attention, uh, Giovanna, I think, uh, because because of our uh, colonial uh, past and history. So um, uh, I remember once I met uh, a Libyan, uh, a Libyan uh, uh, woman, and uh, the, first, uh, the first thing uh, she said was, uh, ha, the colonialist, <laughs> referring to me, which is, of course, not true at all because I've always done uh, and written and studied for Libya just uh, uh, for the passion that I have for Libya and for the country. Uh, being an historian has taught me to love the country and first of all to respect what uh, Libyans have uh, been through to get their freedom uh, against Italians. So I think that uh, this is a, a matter of fact. Um, Italy could do a lot, but the problem is that um, uh, often I see just uh, uh, a, a very basic Italian interest in, uh, you know, solving the electoral problems in Italy to find a consensus uh, and not to, re uh, not to have a vision. Many things have been done and said by different politicians on, okay, we will put and I'm not naming anyone, but it's clear. We will put outposts in uh, Libya uh, between uh, the border with Chad or whatever. And these are crazy things to say and to, and, and to do. So I think that uh, Italy should really, uh, first of all, read this paper, because that could be <laughs> a, a huge acknowledgement, let's say, uh, to their culture and uh, to listen maybe to, to someone else, you know, in, uh, to some specialist uh, and uh, to someone who really knows the country and to Libyans also. That could be a really a good idea. 
So why don't we stay down here, go to Alice and then Jeff and Fred for the other two questions about the tribes and about how our recommendations would affect existing UN or broader policy. Yeah, on the, the gentleman who asked the question about the U.S. being seen as a co-belligerent, you know, I think that's a really important um, possible dynamic for the U.S. To, to always keep in mind, not only in our own efforts to support the Libyans, um, in, including in, pr in uh, proposals like this and sort of figuring out ways towards legitimacy for the security services writ large, um, in ways to build a GPF. This was one of the challenges of the GPF was, well, who's actually showing up for training and what uh, sort of parochial interests do they bring with them and what factions do they represent and who's being sent, et cetera, et cetera. Um, are we just building a new militia for another political actor? These were the sort of the questions that, that um, loomed large in our minds. Um, but then also in our counterterrorism efforts, right? Um, to the extent that we're trying to be pragmatic about our own security, we have to be very, very careful not to empower or disempower groups on the ground or make it look as though alignment with the United States should have larger implications for U.S. diplomatic positions or for political power. Um, these are just really thorny problems. And so I think it's one of those issues that you should keep as a principle in, in your mind certainly as a policymaker, um, but also as you go uh, in each instance to try and figure out what the right thing to do is, that's one of the things you should keep in mind, and I'll leave it at that. Great, thanks. Jeff? Um, thanks. Uh, on, the, on, the on the credibility question, I don't think any of us were under any illusion that every Libyan is in love with the United States or believes the United States. I think we all understood there's a range of there's a range of views about the U.S. and the U.S. rule, uh, the U.S. Uh, potential role in Libya. Um, but what we were trying trying to emphasize was that compared to other outside actors, we do seem to have unusual credibility with some of the key players now. Now, in any in any country in the world. Um, where U.S. diplomats work, there's going to be people that, that question U.S. policy. They're going to question um, the U.S. role. They're going to, going to analyze, not amicably, some of the, some of the U.S. Um, policy positions. Um, so if there's a diplomatic presence on the ground, there's going to be diplomats who are accustomed to dealing with those who have um, questions about U.S. policy. I think that, I think that it's harder to try to um, I don't know if rec reconcile may be too much for some of these groups, but harder to understand um, their grievances, their analysis, harder to, harder to try to inject some other thinking if you aren't there. So it's, it goes back to my point about I, I would like to see um, a permanent U.S. presence back in, back in Libya. On the question about the UN, the UN role, I think that, that what we've tried to do is, is make policy recommendations for, you know, for U.S. decision makers to consider that would be supportive of the U.N. strategy for Libya. After all, the U.S. has endorsed the U.N. strategy for Libya multiple times through the Security Council and through press statements. I think it's largely, it's been largely um, rhetorical support rather than, practic rather than practical support given the lack of presence on the ground, but the U.S. has endorsed it. So I think we've tried to build a strategy that both supports Hassan Salami and what he's trying and what he's trying to do, and is sufficiently independent of that that if the if he needs to pivot or or revise his own strategy or if it simply doesn't work as UN strategies haven't, the U.S. still has options that they could that they could pursue. Great, thank you, Jeff. Fred. <laughs> Sorry. Yes, on the credibility issue again. I mean, Libyan actors are capable of of spinning these narratives against foreigners and, and you know sometimes they're grounded in fact other times they're not and so I don't think we should try to please everybody I mean there's going to be people that are antagonistic to what we're doing I'm um, certain narratives about um, you know our alignment with Misrata but again I think again com as Jeff mentioned compared to other actors we do have um, this reputation of even-handedness um, I think that has to be um, capitalized upon I think it has to be managed um, you know, very carefully, again, in terms of how we interject ourselves on the ground, in terms of um, tr perhaps any training initiatives in the past. We have trained certain units that were composed of particular tribes or factions, and again, that's very dangerous because then you are, in fact, seen as aligning yourself <coughs> with um, a particular uh, group. 
Um, as far as spoilers and tribes, I'm not, I'm, again, I don't know if we should consider entire tribes as acting in unison against a certain, on a position. You know, I mean, Libyan tribes are very diverse, capable of multiple different political, um, you know, positions on certain issues. Um, the bigger question about violent spoilers, I think, leads me to talk about something um, that we haven't fully address, and that's where are the new sources of radicalization that we could see. And I think we need to be attuned to the, the losers of any political settlement, especially the dis displaced. Massive internal displacement from Benghazi, from the South. Um, this could come back and haunt us in terms of where could these young people go for mobilization, um, for militancy. Libyan prisons are a huge problem. Um, in the past, they have been incubators of, of terrorism, of jihadism, and so I'm very concerned about a lot of these militia-run prisons, east and west, and I think we need to be um, attuned to that. On the U.S. backing the U.N. strategy, again, I think it's, it fits it like a glove. I mean, the, the U.N. is heavily invested at the local level through the UNDP stabilization facility. The U.S. is backing that. Um, I, again, I talked to Libyan implementers of that, and they welcome this, this strategy. They see it as, um, as complementing what they're doing. Um, I think the real value added, again, is, is where the U.S. fits at sort of the regional and international level in sort of supporting the U.N.'s efforts at getting regional states behind a consensus and that we do have unique clout. We have exercised it in the past among the Gulf states, among Egypt. Um, on the oil crescent issue in 2017, our intervention was crucial to that. So we have a unique card um, to play that I think can move this, this UN process along, and, and the report um, identifies that. As we go to a final, very quick last round, let me also add my own uh, points on this, which would be that as a task force writing from a think tank, we had the luxury of being able to look a little further down the road and construct a longer term vision and maybe take some of the ideas that are essentially happening on the ground and try to formalize them, to try to imagine where they could go next in a way that the UN may or may not feel it's empowered to do as it's trying to develop consensus among Libyans one step at a time. So our vision, for example, for security force integration with these ultimately regional commands that then get stitched together into a broader national force. Uh, Alice can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that's a little more explicit and a little bit more detailed and visionary than what the UN is able to advocate openly right now, for example. And also as we try to propose that oil revenues go to different local actors, we're trying to make that more formal propose ideas like biometric indicators so the same group doesn't get paid multiple times, try to institute certain basic standards of compliance with human rights practices that would be imposed on groups that wanted to still access those funds, not that the international community would do the imposition, that Libyans themselves would decide this was the right kind of framework. But we were able to suggest that because we don't have to go incrementally one step at a time. We're not, at this point in our lives, diplomats. We are thinking more in a uh, you know, more theoretical and more longer term perspective. That's how I would have uh, also answered the question that you put to us. But I know there's at least one more question, maybe two, and then we'll come back for a very quick final wrap up round. Uh, so the gentleman here in the front row, please. Um, I was wondering if I could ask the panel to expound a little more on the one thing, the one issue that seemed to divide the authors, which is whether there should be a uh, peacekeeping force, some sort of modest force protection on the ground. And rather than leave aside the question of, of whether it should happen, but what would it look like if at some point in the future it does have to happen? Uh, my main question is for Ambassador Feltman. You were at the UN. I understand there were some proposals at least discussed at the UN during the time you were there. How far did the UN get? And what, what did the proposal look like when the UN was considering it? Um, what were the mechanisms for doing it? What would the force have looked like? And then if some of the other panelists on the side that support it doing some sort of um, peacekeeping force, like Kareem, like Fred Frederica, if you could also expound a little bit on what you wrote in the report about that. Great. And then was there one more question, and then we'll come to the panel. Okay, this will be it here in the third row. I was wondering about the category error. We've had a lot of discussion about the East versus the West in Libya. 
and we all hear about how the uh, internationally appointed prime minister, selected and appointed prime minister, um, is talking to an army an army commander uh, in the east of Libya. At this point in time, there's a government um, in the east of Libya which has an interim prime minister recognized by the House of Representatives. The House of Representatives is internationally recognized. But when there are meetings taking place, the focus of the international community is uh, not to talk to the interim prime minister. As far as I understand, no one in the UN or anyone in the uh, international community, the major ambassadors, is talking to anyone in the interim prime minister's uh, Libyan recognized government. Um, and that's an issue, especially with respect to the localization efforts, in that now that the East and the South are controlled by the interim prime minister and providing all the services, it's becoming very difficult for the UNDP and others to actually uh, interact with respect to the provision of services under the local programs to communities in the South, which are very much part of that whole UNDP program. So it's the, the category error that political parties should talk to each other, uh, army parties should talk to each other, like in the Egypt process, um, and, and how do we uh, break through where the UN could actually become a real mediator between the political parties. Thank you. So let's do a quick wrap-up round, since we're already at 11 o'clock, starting with Jeff, since you got the question directly to you, and then we'll go to Kareem and work back down, finishing with Alice, please. Hi, thanks. Um, the, the any UN discussions about peacekeeping in Libya would have, would have taken place before I June joined the UN in June 2012. I, uh, July 1st, 2012 was when I joined the UN. So the peacekeeping discussions were, were prior to that. But they came down, as I understand it, to a question, first of all, of consent. Um, that there, there was no consent by the host government. The Russians made it very clear that they would not support a Chapter 7 resolution, which could have overcome the question of, of consent by the Libyans. Um, and I think, as, you know, as, Fred, as Fred indicated, there was no appetite in, in Washington or elsewhere to really push this, this issue at a time when the Libyans themselves um, didn't, didn't want it and at a time when the U.S. was, was, was um, distracted by many other things. Remember, this, the Libyan revolution took place as the entire Middle East was, was up in the air. I mean, we, we can't look at this only in isolation when it comes to this. But the questions that I would, and I defer to Kareem, whether now the, the question of consent might be overcome, um, because I think that's an essential element. But the things to look at would be first cost. Um, to, the numbers that we ran were quite expensive. If this were a UN peacekeeping force, would the US and others be willing to do the assessed contributions necessary to pay for it? Um, if it's not a peacekeeping force, but a UN-sanctioned force, um, meaning it would be a, um, a multinational force that's sanctioned by the UN, but not a by, by the UN Security Council, but not a UN force itself, still would the, would the contributing countries be willing to pay for it? Second thing is is the troops. Who would go? Who would be the troops that would be on the ground? I don't think that I don't think the Libyans would welcome the Italians, for example. For, for historic reasons. I'm not sure the United States would want to be there, I mean, beyond certain counterterrorism things because of, of ISIS and other, and other reasons. If you look at UN peacekeeping, I don't think the Libyans would want the type of, of South Asian and Sub-Saharan African forces that make up most peacekeeping. I think the Libyans themselves would, would, quest, would question that. And the final question that I would ask would be, what's, what's the actual mission and the, and the anticipated tenure of that mission? We've seen places where peacekeeping operations, whether it's multinational force or the actual UN peacekeeping force, Blue Helmets, are invited by a country, welcomed by a country, but quickly outstay their welcome um, and are no longer as seen as the, the key element they were when they were invited in. So those are the sorts of questions that I would, I would ask, and it, le and it led me to being one of the people that, that didn't support this. In terms of Hassan Salami, I mean, I went with him to, to Beida to see um, the head of the, uh, the um, House of Representatives um, and have been with him in conversations with, with Haftar. I believe that Hassan Salami has done an unusually good job of reaching out across the political spectrum in, inside Libya. Thank you. Great. Yes. Of, of, of course, of course it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a very difficult and nuanced topic. 
for me, it, it, it is something that has evolved from, from what it was in 2011. The purpose that, that the, force, the peacekeeping force would have had was totally different from the one that, would, that it should have had in 2014, or the one we talked about in 2016, and, and, and even for today. Is it going to be a force to, to, to support a government, or is it going to be a force to support two governments, or is it a force that's going to support a new consensus born a government that that, that 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 needs some teeth on the ground to progress uh, 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 we should know what what the, what the need on the ground is the moment it could be asked so just just, just speaking theoretically this it's impossible to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to 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 address the single the single objection and the single question that uh, very brilliantly jeff exposed uh, there, there, are, there are no answers to 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 to, to give now. If it is a, pol a support police force, it has one, one characteristic. It could be done by, by certain countries and not by others, or also because of competence. If it is a, a peacekeeping force, it, it, it will be formed by, by, by a different kind of, of, of command. Of, so it, I know it's, it's very vague. I know I cannot provide an answer, but it, it, it would be silly of me to come into, the, into details that, that have not been addressed because we don't know who is going to ask for it and in w under what conditions and, 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 and precisely for what purpose. Right. Well, just to add to all those um, issues about a, an external force, I mean, again, I think the issue of consent was so important that apparently <clears throat> in, after the fall of Gaddafi, I mean, the transitional council was, was paranoid about even letting the UN let their security people in. I mean, there was just a real sensitivity to any sort of armed, foreign armed force to include the embassies um, forces as well, just for protection. So um, I think that paranoia is still with us, although I have heard various Libyan officials, uh, some militia leaders say they would welcome a force, provided it was the right nationalities. And again, they have a list of nationalities they don't want, which are sort of the, the ones with baggage. So they're talking about Scandinavians, Australians, uh, that they would, they would welcome. But again, the issue of, of mandate, um, would this force have enough firepower to deter a militia attack, but without provoking any sort of foreign intervention force, given the geography of, of the militias in Tripoli and the environs, you would have to have some sort of deal or relationship with another militia. And so how long before you're perceived as siding with a particular faction just by virtue of your location? And so the narrative, I think, could change you know, very, very quickly. And so the force could be perceived as, as not neutral. I mean, some Libyans said perhaps if you had an external force out of the population center, out of people's sight, down in the desert, securing the oil fields, perhaps a foreign, I mean, that might be palatable. But again, a force inside uh, populated centers, again, I think could be very um, problematic from optics, from force protection, from mandate, from all of these, these um, issues. On the issue of Heftar meeting Siraj, I mean, yeah, there's a real, there's a real asymmetry there. Um, I think that's why the army unification talks have, have stalled. Again, Siraj has nothing to sort of offer on his side in terms of the, the unification. I mean, he has these, these militias, Hefter's LNA, which, I mean, we can agree is much more fragmented and more of a coalition than, than appearances suggest, but at least he does have some semblance of, of command, so there is an asymmetry. Um, when I was in Libya, the, a real concern was, yes, that the municipalities in the south are now with the LNA. Um, is the LNA going to allow municipal councils to function? Are they going to militarize governance as they have done in the past? What are the implications of that for international development and assistance efforts where the LNA could basically take the aid and spin it and use it to brand itself and say, we're doing the good governance, we're the interlocutors. So you're basically empowering a form of governance that is unelected, that is military, and is that something we want to be doing? So these are real, real questions. I mean, we faced them in the East, now we have them um, you know, in the South. My sense is, you know, a lot of the people in the South, I mean, they welcome the security that the LNA has provided, but how long is this going to last? You're already seeing some fragmentation, they don't necessarily, just because they welcome the security, they don't necessarily want Heftar to rule, so we have to sort of divide this, um, divide this out. Uh, I think that, it, I mean, I was for a, a, U, a UN force because I think that 
Uh, first of all, a UN force should be in Libya just because Libyans ask for this. So let's start uh, from uh, this assumption. So if Libyans ask for a force, uh, that would be very useful in my opinion because of uh, you know, uh, controlling the terrain and because of the historical experience I have is that it's much easier to have a peace process with an external force uh, um, controlling the situation without uh, anyone. I so rarely disagree with my friend, um, but I was one of the folks that was skeptical of a peacekeeping force, primarily because I think uh, political equilibrium needs to obtain before you're gonna get a successful peacekeeping operation. Um, peace enforcement is a whole other a can of worms as well. Um, and also just because I, and I might just be um, falling under the uh, uh, cognitive bias of analogical reasoning, but I, I have lived through uh, US efforts to support the UN mission in Mali, uh, AMISOM in Somalia, uh, the UN mission in the Central African Republic, and MINUSCO, which is the uh, effort to help stabilize Eastern Congo, and through um, a variety of, of its evolutions. Um, and I uh, just saw those as problematic from the perspective of that political equilibrium had not obtained prior to imposing the peacekeeping force. And so in all of those missions, you just see an enduring re-up of the mandate over and over and over again with sort of no end in sight. Um, so I wasn't convinced that we've hit a point in Libya yet where a peacekeeping force would actually be an accelerant on stability. I think we will leave it at that. And on behalf of John Allen and everyone here at Brookings, thank you for coming. Thanks to the ambassador. Thanks to the panel and the task force. And best wishes to you all. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.